Well, hello and good afternoon here on a Wednesday afternoon in Noonan, Georgia. I'm Kelly Brummett and I'm so happy to be joining you from afar. Good social distancing through our webinars. And I just really thank you for taking time out of your schedule. Um, and whether you're cleaning, you're learning on some other platform or uh, hanging with the kids, I hope that this next hour will be worthwhile to you, mainly from a perspective of just connecting as well as taking the opportunity to think through some things as we get ready to enter back into our practices. Um, like I said, I'm Kelly Brummett, and I am a visiting faculty uh, instructor at the Pinky Institute. And the Pinky Institute is a nonprofit organization, and I am on the board of directors as well. And I've been very fortunate to have been uh, mentored through the Pinky Institute to be a alumni of the Pinky Institute. And it has really just been a big piece of my life. Uh, it has changed my life, my practice. It allowed me to discover what kind of dentist I wanted to be, as well as to be supported by some awesome people. And uh, again, I just welcome you. And one of the reasons that I wanted to talk with you today was that in the midst of this epidemic, which is now a pandemic, I started thinking about, well, what, what we're going through and how it's being kind of broadcast to the public. And what I was discovering was that it's probably the first time in my history that we have dealt with a pandemic it's the first time that the media has been involved in broadcasting signs and symptoms to the public. And the first time that people at home are asked to go through a triage checklist to discover if they do have any of the signs and symptoms related to the coronavirus, and then to move forward if they do. And what struck me about that is I believe it's so important that people understand signs and symptoms and that we as healthcare providers are part of that process. Now, the slide that you see here, I, I pulled off of the coronavirus.gov website and it basically has three main signs, which is a fever, a cough, an acute respiratory distress syndrome, or some other respiratory event that's causing you to feel very constricted, very abnormal breathing. And those seem to be lining up pretty much in that order that's leading people to get a test and discover whether they're positive or not. There are some other symptoms that they're finding in there like cardiac symptoms, and as we get smarter about this virus, they're gonna add up. However, what I thought was really amazing and interesting for the public is how clear it was to look on this website and to discover these signs and symptoms to discover what you needed to do for your own health and your family's health. And I got to thinking about that's how we are with our patients. You know, dentistry, is not just a doing um, profession. We get to do a lot of really cool and interesting tasks. However, we get to do the things with our patients because there's a need related to a sign and a symptom that leads to a diagnosis, then leads to a treatment. And so I wanted to see if we could have a conversation about that today. And I'm not an expert. I am a general restorative dentist. I am like any other practicing dentist. However, I think it's a good conversation for us to just think about because I think it could relate to how we enter back into our practices. 
And hopefully by the end of this conversation today, you'll see that and maybe we can even develop that. So what I wanted to also, before I get too far into this, is that if you have any questions during this conversation, to feel free to post those in the chat box and um, I'm happy to stop and answer any questions. And then if not, we can wait till the end and answer any questions. So as we move forward here, signs and symptoms. Now, one of the things, the world that I come from, before I was a dentist, I was a nurse. So I worked in the medical environment. And as a nurse, I worked in ENT, um, I worked with oral surgery and cardiac and also children psychiatric care. And one of the things as a nurse that you are taught is how to recognize signs and symptoms because you are an integral part of the team to help the physicians and the people that are planning the treatment and dealing and differentiating their diagnoses about about what's working, what's not working. And so signs and symptoms were really a huge part of my nursing career. And in the medical world, there is what we call a soap note. And most of you know what a soap note is. And some of you have done some type of residency training or some extra training that in the medical world, that's a requirement as a note. So we have a subjective and objective and assessment and we have a plan. And What's great about the medical world is that oftentimes people have something subjective going on, which causes them to enter into a medical office or an ER or, or something. And I say that's wonderful because there's, they, they see that something's going on. And I don't mean that to be disrespectful because sometimes there's something that's really traumatic going on. But what I mean is that there is oftentimes the patient has a subjective understanding of something that is abnormal. Now, in the dental world, what I think we tend to have more of is more of an objective situation that turns to the subjective. And so I kind of changed the soap note around. And the reason I did that was Dr. Pankey talked a lot in his book on philosophy about how when you're meeting a patient, you go through a preclinical interview with a patient and you get to meet them, you get to develop some rapport, and then you get an opportunity, hopefully, to do what is called a clinical tour. And in that clinical tour, oftentimes you're making observations that sometimes the patient hasn't brought to your attention because they might not be symptomatic. So what I thought was interesting about looking at the coronavirus, looking at the medical community, and then looking at the dental community and saying that we really have a gift in what we do in, in dentistry. And that gift is that we actually get to sit with patients more than once a year. Oftentimes we get to sit with our patients at least two times a year, maybe three to four times a year if there's a periodontal management maintenance program going on. Maybe more than that, if we're in the midst of some type of restorative treatment, maybe occlusal treatment. So we have the luxury with a lot of our patients to actually see them more frequently and help them maybe see what we see and relate that to symptoms that they have and didn't associate those to anything that was abnormal or symptoms that they didn't know that they had <laughs> or how, it, how those signs and those symptoms relate in order to get to a treatment plan. And so I think what I hope out of today is that we can, we can help not only ourselves, but our team understand that when we can help a patient understand that their signs and symptoms are what are contributing to their problems, to their potential discomfort, and relate that that creates a plan for that patient, but the plan is based off the signs and symptoms 
not off of just what we see. Before we get too far in that, I wanna make sure that we also remember that our patients are humans. They didn't go to dental school and they oftentimes don't necessarily need to know all the information that we do. And we don't necessarily need to always tell them everything that we know. I know I have been guilty of kind of throwing up information on my patients to one, inform them, but two, sometimes, you know, we want to let people know what we know. However, what I have learned through my years of dentistry and practicing with patients is that oftentimes the less I tell them, the more I show them and involve them, the more I find that the patient comes along with the treatment and the understanding about the signs and the symptoms that they have been experiencing. So Edgar Dale had a cone of experience um, that research event that he did back in the 50s. And we pretty much all know that, you know, if you, if you tell me something, I'm, you know, I have a good chance of forgetting it. Uh, if I read it and you tell me, I might, you know, remember that better. And if I get a chance to somehow experience the learning, if I get a chance to maybe touch it, if I get to see it, if I get to hear it, if I get to involve more of my senses, I have a better chance of understanding, being able to be involved in decisions, being able to actually be vulnerable enough to communicate my fears and my concerns. And that's whenever I find the most benefit to taking care of patients. Relationships are built, trust is built, and then the observations that we share and the understanding that they return to us just gets enhanced. And so it's wonderful whenever we can just continue to remember that when we're sitting with that patient, we all learn differently. Some of us quick, some of us just want the facts, some of us want the details. And you know, I do believe in understanding one yourself personally, understanding your type of personality, understanding the way that you communicate, and also understanding the person that you're with. And maybe flexing your style in order to make that experience for them even better. And I find that if I can ask permission, that any way that I'm communicating with the patient doesn't make sense, or I need to find another way to communicate with them, that I wanna know that. And I would much rather know that on the beginning end. I'll tell you, one of the things that I have um, learned through the years is that when we ask people about their expectations, rather than waiting, we have less surprises. So again, I just encourage you to is my sound doing okay? I had somebody to comment. Yeah, your sound is fine on my end, Kelly. I would tell folks that your if the video is breaking up or the audio is breaking up wherever you are, that's uh, that's internet connectivity. It could be where you are as well as where we're sending from. Unfortunately, uh, everyone in, everyone on the planet is online at the moment, so uh, we're using up our bandwidth. But so far on my side, you're doing pretty well. Okay. Okay. Thanks. So, and I popped in Kelly actually because I'm really curious. Um, what are the what are the things that you implemented in your practice um, to create co-discovery? I mean, you know, I hear lots of people talk about different things, photography, a hand mirror. I mean, what were some of the things that for you worked best for you? Because I don't know that all the tools work equally well for each of us. It depends on our personality, I think. Right. I think. And we will get to that, but I think one of the very important parts that worked for me was a camera. A camera, whether that was extraoral or was intraoral. And um, 
I just think that that visual with the hearing and whether that be a physical, you know, action within the process of discovering what's going on with the patient is just huge. Um, it, it's part of, let me show you why I say what I say versus just believe me, just trust me. And um, I know for myself as a patient, um, I have been a patient on many realms that that's a, that's a big deal for me. I want to understand what you're talking about versus just tell me to do it and I'll show up because I probably won't. I'm kind of stubborn like that. Well, yeah, I'm glad you're going to get into that because it's always, I always learn something when I hear different methodologies other people use around co-discovery. And sometimes it's always like, I can't believe I didn't think of that, but you didn't, you hear somebody else say it. So I'll get out of yeah. your way and let you keep, keep going. So the, the whole thing is most people, I, you know, I hear a lot of times when I'm teaching with um, participants and, and talking to other dentists, you know, a lot of us want more case acceptance. We want more case acceptance. And I just think if, if we can go back to the signs and the symptoms and we can relate that to the diagnosis that we come up with and how that treatment plan is developing, my hope is, is that the case acceptance will go up. So I want to just continue to just leave that in the background that, um, you know, it's one thing that we're dealing with signs and symptoms, objective and subjective information. And we're also dealing with a person that's learning, a person that they've been doing things potentially, you know, if I have a 70 year old in my chair for 70 years or at least 60. Um, and so just remembering that it's not just about evidence, but it's also about the person that we're dealing with. And so if we're dealing with signs, we know that signs are objective. You know, signs are, you walk in the practice and the half of your face is swollen. Um, coronavirus, a sign is that you are hot and sweaty and um, you take your temperature, a sign is a elevated temperature. A symptom of that sign can be your face is half swollen and it hurts. You can't lay down. You can't open up your mouth. You may have trouble breathing. A symptom of a fever can be that you feel fatigued, that you feel just hot and then you feel cold. And understanding signs and symptoms as a patient can also help us with managing our care. I do believe Rachel Remen is a great um, physician that spends a lot of time in her books, you know, writing about how the patient is their own doctor. And I really think that we as dentists, our goal is to help our patients be their own physician and advocate for themselves and bring to the table the things that they're curious about, the things that they're experiencing. So that way we can help them to, to move towards health and to move towards being comfortable and to not having major um, emergencies occur. And it can be challenging though, because it can also be in our society, we're not supposed to kind of pay attention to signs. You know, we gotta get up, we gotta go to work, we gotta come home, we gotta cook dinner, we gotta do the laundry, we gotta clean the house, we gotta mow the yard, we're, we have to get through and so, Stopping and looking and feeling can sometimes be the detriment of what every one of us needs to do on a daily basis. So I think that can sometimes be why you might sit with a patient who has a broken tooth and you think, well, did you have any symptoms? Did you know, did you know that something was going on? And they, they tell you, no, I was eating a piece of bread. But the reality is if you can slow down and walk back through maybe some past, and that's where the photography really comes in, especially patient of record, you can really help them understand that the signs often lead to those symptoms and how we can help our patients move forward and prevent more dentistry. So as I was thinking about this, I'm thinking about when a patient's in our practice and they come through with an exam. And that exam can be a comprehensive exam. It could be a limited exam. It could be a periodic exam. 
And I think that one of our goals as dentists is to help our patients relate their signs and symptoms through each part of that exam. And for the purpose of the webinar and the amount of time that we do have together, I just thought we could walk through maybe the main areas of the exam and I could share some examples of how you can relate those signs and symptoms. And then if anybody had anything to add to that, please do because it's a great way for all of us to learn from one another. But if we start with the medical history, now medical history is very important. And I have been in situations where I have seen patients say, oh, you know, my medical history isn't any different. But the important thing about the medical history is that it gives you information about a patient and it helps the patient understand maybe what's going on with them and why they may have some things going on in the dental health. So for example, if I had a patient come in and they had a medical history that they said they were a type two diabetic, I would want to talk with them about, okay, so person, patient X, when did you discover you were diabetic? I'd wanna know a timeline. I'd wanna know how do you take care of this disease process? Do you take a pill? And if they do, do they check their blood sugar? A lot of people take a pill and do not check their blood sugar because they haven't been told that that's needed. They tend to go to their doctor, they get an A1C and they get monitored. However, there are some patients that aren't changing their lifestyle and they may need to check their blood sugar, even on a medication. They may need some more information about how they can manage that, that care. And we as dentists can be a part of that. We, don't, we can help advocate with them and with the physician about how to encourage them to manage their care. If I have a patient who tells me that they manage their care by checking their blood sugar, but they're constantly at a 200 or above, and if they told me that in their medical history, and when I'm going through the exam and looking at their soft tissues, and I'm noticing that there is swelling, that the hygienist tells me that there's bleeding, that's an opportunity to relate those signs back to the patient in regards to this may be related to their underlying condition of their diabetes. You see, I think sometimes I've missed the opportunity to help a patient understand that when people bleed or when people have red swollen gums, it's not always just because they didn't brush well. Sometimes it is. But if on their medical history, there is something particular that they are dealing with and managing, and then I see a sign or my hygienist sees a sign, it's an opportunity to communicate that back to the patient. So if I see bleeding and redness and spongy tissue, I may ask, you know, so tell me when your last, what your last blood sugar was. What was it this morning? What was it, you know, in the evening? What do you, what's your management process? To help them understand that I could sit there all day and say, you, can, you need to brush more, you need to floss more to get your gums better. But the reality is there may be an underlying situation that we can help advocate with the patient and with the physician to help them get healthier. Medical history is also really important because it's a sign of a patient's compliance. I was doing a lit search and in the United, in, well, the NIH in 2018 said that there were 34.2 million Americans or individuals with diabetes. And out of that 34 million, they had figured out that 7.3 of those were undiagnosed. Okay, so then if you take all those people that have diabetes, they said that 50% of the population of those patients weren't taking their medications consistently or properly. So 
what the medical history also does is it helps us understand what a patient is doing on a daily basis to take care of themselves and maybe how we can help them. So if, if they tell me, yeah, I have, um, I have medication that I sometimes take, but I sometimes forget it. Um, it might be a, a way to have a conversation because oftentimes patients will, for, will not be compliant with their medications because of forgetfulness, fear, finances. And I'll be honest with you, I think sometimes people have trouble talking about their medications because they're hard to pronounce. I have watched so many people on the news and you guys probably have too, there are hard names to pronounce. And so sometimes it's easier just to say, I take a blood pressure medicine than it is to really name the true medication. But I do think it's important if my, if my let me put it this way. When I was a nurse, when a patient came to our floor, they would have a bag of medications because cardiac patients tended to take at least five plus medications. And oftentimes their medications were in a bag. And we would go through their medications and when a patient could name them and tell me what they were for, I felt really confident that this person was, was engaged in the treatment. It's not a judgment. It's just whatever reason that patient was engaged. The other thing is that if they told me, well, that's a blue pill that I take at eight, and, if, and that's a brown pill that I take at five, but I don't know what it's for, then, then I, I wonder what that's about. And so again, it's just relating, having a conversation about medical history and relating it to what you see clinically as the dentist and the signs and symptoms. Radiographs. You know, if I go into a hygiene check and I have an x-ray up, I ask my hygienist to please have the medical history up, to please have the x-rays up if they took them, or the, the previous x-rays up, I always want to compare them and then any other intraoral photos that they've taken. And if I look at a x-ray and I notice something looks a little off on, let's say number two and three, and the hygienist says to me, you know, um, there's some bleeding around two and three, then I might get a piece of floss and floss through it. So I'm observing the x-ray, I'm, I'm listening to what the hygienist says, and I'm observing the contact. And let's say the contact's open. And then I might ask the patient, you know, patient, have you noticed that this is an area where you trap food? And they may say, you know what, yeah, I, I notice that every time I eat, especially chicken or meat, I've got to get some floss out and, and clean that area. Well, what I want to do then is relate it back to what I see with what symptoms they may have or not have and the treatment that we can develop together. So if they had a previous filling, let's say a large MO amalgam on tooth number two, there's an open contact, I may help them understand that the concern here is the bacteria getting underneath this filling and what we need to be prepared for. I give them a heads up, or it might help us understand that, yes, you have recurrent decay under here, and here's why. Um, I also, radiographically, we're using radiographs for not just decay, but we're using those for periodontal purposes. Now, it's a two-dimension image, and we have the, the luxury of three-dimensional three images now. And um, it's an opportunity to say, okay, what do I see radiographically? What do I see bone level wise? What do I see periapically? You know, there are times that we can look at our periapicals and we can see a widened PDL, that lamina dura around the tooth and question whether the tooth is mobile and see if there's anything going on periodontally with that tooth to decrease the chance of losing that tooth. Another place that, um, and, and I guess, let me, let me back up. So with periodontally, it, it's really common that we'll walk, I, I've had hygienists come get me, you know, we, get, we have a new patient or, or an existing patient, let's say something's changed and probing depths have gone up, or maybe they're in the range that a scaling and root planing is in accordance with the patient's needs for eliminating 
the, the bacterial presence and, the, and managing the treatment. And whenever I walk in the room, you know, the patient may already understand this from the hygienist about what the possible treatment is, but I wanna take that treatment back to the signs and symptoms. Again, treatment plan is one thing. A treatment plan is not your diagnosis, in my opinion. A treatment plan is a development conversation about how you're going to phase treat, how you're going to phase the, the procedures. I believe that the signs and symptoms through the works of showing them the x-rays, showing them the enteral photos, showing them the bleeding points, showing them the numbers, letting them hear the numbers. In my practice, periodontally, we always had an assistant with a hygienist to put the periodontal numbers in the computer. One, I believe it's important that the patient hear the numbers. I think it's important to say out loud where the bleeding points are. I think it's important to say out loud where the mobility is and the areas of recession. And what, what that does is it takes us from that objective only and brings it forefront to the patient so they can start relating what we're observing to what they might be feeling or what they've been dealing with at home. They just maybe didn't understand how it related. Another area that, um, just looking at what time it was. would be in the joints. And so when patients come in and, and, and we're dealing with signs and symptoms of, of joints, I oftentimes will have patients say, oh, I don't do that. I don't clench, I don't grind, I don't have any, any symptoms whatsoever. And that is all good because at that moment they might not. However, if I see a sign of a potential concern related to a risk factor of their joints or their muscles, I want to share that with them. I want to help them see what I see and feel what I feel. So relating the sign and symptom, again, goes back to the photography. If I see wear on canines and I see recession and I see maybe um, uh, abfractions, or I see um, maybe some angulation of teeth, you know, some type of wear pattern. I want to help connect that sign that I see to helping the patient understand there might be a symptom they just didn't understand was a symptom. I had a patient that <laughs> would always um, tell me that they got a headache, but they only got a headache, um, a tension headache and they would always point right here. And so whenever I asked her to, you know, put her hand on her face and gently, not pressing, because a lot of times patients will, will compress their, their muscles, but put your hand on your face and clench your teeth together and tell me if you feel that muscle bulge. And they did. And I would just say, you know, I see signs on the teeth and I wanna show you, and I would show them with photography these signs that I see. And I'm wondering if you could just do me a favor and just pay attention to these and just see if you happen to notice anytime your teeth come together, that's not when you're chewing. And just let me know. And oftentimes what I would discover is that the patient would say, oh, well, I didn't even realize that that was connected to some of my discomfort. That would be a great opportunity to take a sign and implement a tool like a quick splint, for example, and let a patient go home with that. So that way you could start observing more of the tendencies they may have that they aren't aware of. Oftentimes people are aware, but they just don't either have the time to deal with it and they don't want to deal with it. They're afraid it's too much money. And so again, it goes back to that expectation, you know, and, and Dr. Pinky talked a lot about when we're going through a clinical tour and we're observing with the patient, 
it's really important to, to talk with the patient and ask them about what they, what, what their expectations are of, of that tour. And, and share with them, you know, if, if I'm sitting in a, in a clinical tour and I'm, I'm gonna have an assistant or a hygienist or somebody with me, and we'll see that in a little bit, but we wanna talk out loud about this. I've, I've been around some hygienists and some assistants that are used to not talking. They're used to quiet. And I think it's really important in my practice, I want my patients to hear the conversation about them because they're there for us to concentrate on them. And I think the more that we can involve them in the experience with with hearing us, with looking at things and all that, we're gonna help them identify these signs and these symptoms, maybe on an earlier end. Because honestly, the goal is, wouldn't it be great if they didn't really need us? Wouldn't it be great if people didn't need dentistry, that they were that healthy? Now, I love what I do, but I'll be honest, if we could have a healthy population and not have to deal with viruses and breakage, and pain, it would be fantastic. So again, temporal mandibular joint signs and symptoms, one of the ways that I think is the easiest to communicate with them is to have them feel and, and ask them to think about it. I think when people get the opportunity to think, they can sometimes learn to discover. One of the other areas in our exam that we do is the occlusal piece of the exam. And, you know, this might just be tooth to tooth contact. This might be functional movement of the jaw. It might be noises that we hear, the joint muscles involved with the occlusion. I think they're interrelated. Um, but again, you know, if, if a patient walks into my practice and they have broken a tooth, I want to show them what I see. I want to walk through any of those signs that they may have been experiencing or been told by a previous provider or myself about why that tooth broke. I want to relate it to their symptoms that they're feeling. And then I want to relate it to the treatment because if a patient breaks a tooth, I can put a crown on it. All of us in dentistry, we can do a really good crown. We were taught well. However, if I don't understand that cause, which is one of the, the things that I loved about Dr. Pinky's philosophy, is that he really wanted us as dentists to help patients understand not only what happened, but why it happened. Simon Sinek is great with that, you know, start with why. We can do the how and the what, but let's figure out the why, and let's slow down enough that we can do this. So if a patient has broken that tooth and I can show them and I can talk with them about discovering some of the signs that were adding up to that. So let's say, you know, we in over the last two years that we've known each other, every time I've met you in the hygiene department, I've, I've asked you if you notice any signs of clenching or grinding and you have told me no, that's wonderful. However, I'm wondering now, is there any relationship that you're picking up on with this breakage or what was it something in particular you ate? If there's no identifying fork that they bit down on or a beer can that they tried to open with their teeth, um, I wanna see if I can help them understand that chronic issues that develop into these signs and symptoms that led to the diagnosis and the treatment need is, is, what's, is what we want because what it can do is drive us to help them focus in on the other areas of their mouth. You know, Mary Osborne told me once, um, we were talking about being comprehensive and about how it's hard to be comprehensive in a practice. It's, it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of energy. And when you are hopping from chair to chair it's, it's really challenging to try to figure out those moments to be comprehensive. And what she asked me was really interesting and I have carried it with me. And she said, no matter what you're doing as a dentist, 
whether it's a limited exam when someone comes in because they broke their tooth or a person who's sitting in your chair that you're getting ready to do uh, 24 crowns, upper and lower, 12 over 12 teeth, isn't everything you do comprehensive? And I was like, you know, that's right. Because every time I get a chance to meet with a patient and to talk with a patient, to talk about signs that I may see, we're relating it back comprehensively to discovering any symptoms, to discovering what they know, what they don't know, and to asking them to be a part of the process to discover what's needed and what's not needed. So the interesting thing is we as dentists, we really are able to meet our patients comprehensively from, from as simple as a limited exam to all the way to comprehensive, what, what I would say is complex care. I believe that in instituting this in your practice requires a few things. It requires us to record our observations and to do that in a way that's shared with the patient. And you can decide for yourself, is it out loud? Is it just a verbal? Is it out loud and with a TV monitor right in front of you? I'll show you in a minute how I had a, a hygienist chose to, to do this with a patient. Um, and not only recording these observations, but when we state these observations to our assistant, the patient hears it. And then getting the opportunity to not only state those observations, but ask the patient questions. Questions can help us discover what the patient's aware of and what they're not aware of. I think the other thing that's interesting with this is that we can incorporate the photos. I think the photos are a really valuable piece. And then read back those observations again, even in the face of those photos. And somehow, whatever it may be, connect that data back to those signs and symptoms and back to the understanding for the patient. You see, we're there for the patient to understand, not, not just for us to understand or our assistant to understand what our plan is, but for the patient to understand why we see things that we see and why these develop into different types of symptoms. Photography, I've said it a lot, but I 100% believe that extraoral photography and intraoral photography is key in, in helping a patient see signs and symptoms. If you had to give me only one tool to work with, this is what I would want. And if I only could choose one, I probably would choose the intraoral camera. Don't shoot me if you disagree with me. But the reason is, is that it's really fairly easy and complex for everyone on your team to use it. My hygienist did this herself. This is not my hygienist, this is a stock photo. But what she would do is do exactly what you see on this photo. She would walk through, take a clinical tour through the patient's mouth at the beginning of their appointment. And this was for everyone. And she would look up at the monitor with the patient. Now, every patient's different on how they viewed this. She asked them permission and she would do this. And what she learned was how much more she was able to engage her patient. What it also did was it actually set the patient up for me when I walked in the room. So that way the patient was already involved. The patient was already aware of, oh yeah, you remember that last time you told me about that tooth that you could tell that the margins of the filling were starting to get bad and were maybe gonna leak? Well, it's ready, I'm ready for that filling. Oftentimes I didn't even have to discuss treatment with the patient. So developing a way to talk with your patients, I think it just requires you as a team to sit back. And that's something we can do in this quiet time right now, is to sit back and say, you know, how do we want to communicate with our patients? What are we doing currently? And where, what can we maximize on? Because I know that it's important to stay on time. I know it's important to keep a certain number of patients through your practice. I understand that. And especially thinking back to, I got to go back to my practice and make up for this now. I understand that. But I think you can do that and relate this all back to what the patient signs and symptoms are 
in order to move the treatment forward. So um, what, I'm, what I'm thinking about is just a feedback loop. And it's, it's developing those signs and symptoms conversations. It's helping your patients see what you see, hear about what you see, and relate it back to any symptoms they may have. For example, if someone says that every time I, I drink um, something cold or I have a starburst, up here it hurts. Well, then I'm gonna ask, you know, how many times do you have starburst? Well, one a day. I have them on my desk and I have one one a day. Um, I used to do that with Laffy Taffy, so I guess that's, I should have used the Laffy Taffy example. But, okay, so you eat one of those every day and now you have a pain in your tooth. Okay, well now we can develop a treatment, which is, okay, you're right. You have a hole in your tooth and now we have a cavity and now we need to do a filling. And maybe instead of eating the Laffy Taffy or the Starburst on the other side of your mouth because it hurts, maybe we can address the nutritional aspect to decrease the chances of having other symptoms and damage to the other parts of the mouth. Relate those signs and symptoms so the patient can engage. Less tell, more show, and involvement. If we, can, if we can engage the patient, and to me, an engaged patient is a patient that's asking you questions. If we can raise the awareness, then we can relate it back to those signs and symptoms. And it's this feedback loop. And any time the patient comes in for treatment, I oftentimes will try to re- um, visit that feedback loop. So for example, if a patient comes in and they were doing a crown prep, I will ask the assistant to have the photo of the crown prep or the tooth that we're prepping up on the screen. And they're going to ask the patient they you know why they're there that day. Because so I don't want them to think they're there for cleaning. Um, and I'm going to walk in, I'm going to walk back through. It's like a consent. You know, do you remember these signs and symptoms that we went over? Remember the tooth? Here's the treatment we discussed, and here's the process. Are we good with that? And again, it also helps them understand how to take care of it, how to, what to look out for in the future and the rest of their mouth, because I don't want to do single tooth dentistry. I want, to, I want to take care of each tooth at the patient's speed. However, I want them to know that I want to help them comprehensively in their entire mouth. Something just popped up that I looked at, you know, somebody, somebody posted that not everyone who has an asymptomatic crack on a tooth will schedule a crown the same visit. 100% agree with that. And I don't expect that you should schedule a visit. What I'm wondering is, well, what I'm hoping that you hear is that if I notice that there's a crack in a tooth, what kind of a crack? I don't think all cracks are equal. I think some are part of the process of our tooth absorbing force. I think some can be detrimental. And I wanna use maybe my photography or my intraoral camera and show the signs that I see, help relate it to that asymptomatic you know, conversation that they are having. So that way, if they become symptomatic, they know why. It's, it's an opportunity that you've laid the, found, the, the foundation. It's like when I take my car in for an oil change we really get that opportunity with our patients because I take my car in for an oil change, but I know that part of the process is they're also checking out other things. They always give me a heads up. Next time you come in the next so many miles, we're going to have to do X. I love that. I'm prepared. I can, I can budget. I can think about it. And from a time standpoint, so that's what we're doing. Patients are not always symptomatic. And that's what I mean. Signs and symptoms. They, just because you see something doesn't mean that I'm developing a treatment or I'm recommending a treatment, but it is, it's planting that seed. It's laying that, found, that foundation for the patient to understand where things are coming from. I just believe that if we can communicate with our patients better, we can lead them to what Dr. Pinky spent his entire life focused on, which was to help our patients develop comfort, to improve their overall health not just their tooth health, but their overall health, and to improve their function. And in the end, usually their aesthetics. I do think that you know, form follows function, and 
when things work well, they tend to look really good. And I think that if we can just think about this time right now, it's, it's, a, it's a crazy time. I keep saying that every day I say, this is crazy. This is crazy. I'm almost like, I grew up in the Midwest where tornadoes were, so I know how to act in that. And now I'm at live in the South, I live in Georgia, and now I understand hurricanes. But I keep waiting for like something to hit. And, and we're in this such unknown territory. And, but I think it's an opportunity for us to step back and think. And think about when we are talking to our patients about treatment, how are we relating it? And can we help them understand so that way they can move forward with treatment? I think that um, my hope for is, is, is two things. I have a lot of hope for it, but I'm just gonna say two things. I thought about, wouldn't it, would it be a possibility for you as, as dentists while you have this downtime, the people that were on your schedule, if you went to your software and you looked at the people that were scheduled, let's say you had a crown schedule that you had in March and now you know you're not doing it until May or, or June, I don't know. And if you reached out to that patient while you're on this downtime, whether it was email or a phone call and say, you know, um, let's just say it's Sally. Sally, we had you scheduled for that crown on number three because when you were in, we identified that you were having some symptoms related to biting pressure and we, we noted that you had that large silver filling that was bigger than half your tooth. And I just wanted to reach out to you and touch base with you and make sure that you weren't having any major symptoms. I know right now we're not supposed to be seeing patients I will see you for an emergency, but I just wanted to let you know that as soon as we can get back in the office, I look forward to taking care of you. That's one thing that developing signs and symptom conversation can help in this transition time with patients while we're not in the office. Um, the other thing is, you know, signs and symptoms can help us understand patient risk. You know, we can identify the risks that our patients have through these signs and symptoms, which can lead us to that plan. The other thought I had about some things that you, you can do moving forward back into the office is also, um, you know, Dr. Pankey really spent a lifetime, his lifetime in helping Dennis explore, just like this quote says, what, what, what excellence meant for them. You know, it's not excellence that he defined. It was, what, what is excellence for you as a dentist? That's what I love about this philosophy. It's, it's what's good for me. It's what's good for you. And renewing that commitment to what you want to do. This may be a time that you can sit back and renew your commitment to your system of how are we communicating with our patients about their signs and symptoms? How can we relate back? Because I think people are going to now be bring this full circle back to the coronavirus, I think people are going to be more aware and willing to be more cognizant of signs and symptoms they are having to prevent problems. What a great opportunity. And what a great opportunity we have to have the privilege to take care of other people. Now, this is my family, my son, Sam, my daughter, Sarah, my husband, Darren, and I thank you very much for this time. Um, we're running out of time and I have talked a little bit too long, I apologize. But real quickly, um, check out the rest of our webinars at, at pinkygram um, forward slash webinars and every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And I hope that this was helpful. Um, are there any questions? So Kelly, there actually were a couple of questions. Um, one question that we had was, how often do you recommend or how often were you taking photographs in your practice? Every six months, every year, did you have a protocol? I did. So with every hygiene visit, my hygienists were expected to take photos, intraoral photos. Um, what that did was it gave us a data documentation that we could compare. And it also helped us relate the observations that we were finding or any of the symptoms that they were having. And extra orally, 
we, we did those on patients that we were, um, whether they were new patients that were identified towards certain types of treatment. I didn't do that on every new patient right off the bat. It oftentimes took several visits to discover where a patient was desiring and needed to go. But as far as intraoral photos, every patient, every time. Um, I also utilized that in my own treatment. It was a way to diagnose, I mean, to document what I was doing. So before a filling, after a filling, during a filling, a crown, whatever the treatment, to help the patient understand. Awesome, great. And um, Greg Maxson had asked if you had any um, tips or tricks um, for trying to um, listen more and not jump in and talk, especially with patients who are maybe not the biggest talkers or who are not necessarily the, the people who are really engaging with you really quickly? I think, I think some of that is to, if you can ask a question and if you don't get much response back, then maybe realize that you may have to ask that question multiple times to be patient. I think for some people they need to process or they need to think because it's the first time maybe you brought it up. They've never heard this before and they've never even thought about it. So one, it's either slow down to give them some space to think and respond or ask multiple times. Great. So also had a question about um, whether or not you charge your patients when you do those photographs as part of the diagnostic process. No, uh, that's all included in my data collection. It's all included in part of my care and our, our care as a, as a team. And you know, one thing I didn't say, and do you have another question? Um, so there is another question coming up after this one about using another device for Carrie's direction. But so if you want to finish photography, then I can get you that one. Or do you want me to tell you to you, that one to you now? Tell that one to me now. Okay. So um, Shetty is asking, um, he just ordered a Carrie View, so a digital Carrie's detection system, and just okay. wanting to know if you've used it in addition to intraoral photography and whether or not you've had a good experience with it. Um, what's, what's the name of it? Um, Carrie View. Okay, I haven't. Um, I, think, I think every tool is an awesome addition. However, it's just remember it's a tool. That, that's my advice. And to remember it's just a, a, another piece of the puzzle to bring the signs and symptom conversation to the patient. So absolutely, what works in your hands, what works in your conversation and communication to your patient, utilize it. I haven't used it, so I'm, I can't speak to it. Awesome. All right. Well, it looks like that was the end of the questions other than a bazillion people saying, thank you. Awesome job. So I will uh, mirror that Kelly and say, um, really, really great job. Thank you. Um, thanks for, uh, being willing to jump in here and do this with us. I know everybody appreciated it and, um, to everybody else, um, join us again on Friday, same time. Um, you can either sign in like this on Zoom or you can watch us on Facebook Live. Um, so stay well, everybody. And Kelly, thank you so much for an awesome, awesome webinar. Thank you. Thank you. And I guess one last thing I want to add is just remember that utilize your team. You're one person. Don't forget that they are there because you're a great leader and you can go back into your practice whenever you get out of this coronavirus epidemic pandemic and and take care of your patients so good luck and be well